Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last March, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person at 6300 A Street or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we are about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of the faith that we share. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in this year when so much is uncertain, we know that transformation is necessary. This is the place for it. This is the time. Who will we be? How will we be? In this time of anxiety and pandemic and fear, what are we called to be as a community? In our 150th year as a congregation, who are we and what are we doing? This is, as Res Reverend Susan Frederick Gray puts it, no time for a casual faith. She also says this is no time to go in alone. And this, right now, right here, is where we practice that. So take a moment as we begin the service this morning. Be present right here, right now. Let go of what you've carried here this morning. Set aside what will come later. Be right here. There is work to be done. Let's be about it. This morning, we join with Unitarian Universalist congregations across the country in a shared service put together by the Unitarian Universalist Association's organizing collective, UU The Vote. I'm excited to be a part of this. I'm excited to hear a homily from Susan Frederick Gray, where she unpacks what it means that to have a faith that where we do not go it alone and where we do not treat faith casually in this moment in time. This weekend is also National Voter Registration Day, which I know they're talking about uh, as part of the service. And we'll end with a call to action. As we light this chalice today, let us not be fooled by the smallness of the flame. There is heat to the small flame that burns and stings like our movements for justice. Through this small flame, we hear the roar of our black indigenous and ancestors of color. Yet when we are not responsible keepers of this flame, places sacred to us and loved ones can be harmed. There is warmth to this flame that roots us in our community through all seasons. Let us remember that as we light this flame, may it not light just the flame of truth within our hearts, but may it light that prophetic fire that moves us to bold action this season and beyond. May it be so. Now is the time for worship. When skies turn orange and apocalyptic red, now is the time for worship. When children and adults are in cages, now is the time for worship. When uprisings demand our action and justice is needed, now is the time for worship. Time to take care of our souls and our healing and community. Now is the time for worship. Let us mobilize our spirits. Now is the time for worship. 
Bring your prophetic grief. Bring your holy rage as we move into this sacred hour. Now is the time for worship. Let the bells toll from steeples and the calls to prayer echo from minarets. Now is the time for worship. Let us gather, friends. Please join me in singing hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. Love will guide us, peace has tried us, hope inside us will lead the way on the road from greed to giving. You can change the world with your love if you cannot sing like angels if you cannot speak before thousands you can give from deep within you you can change the world with your love you are like no other being what you can no other can give to the future of our precious children, to the future of the world where we live. Love will guide us, peace has tried us, hope inside us will lead the All right, everyone. So gather together because we are going to talk about somebody amazing. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was born and raised into a free black family in 1825. Her family lived in Maryland where slavery was still legal. Being born free in a land where people who looked like you were enslaved was something that inspired both Frances and her family to become abolitionists. When she was very young, both of her parents died and she went to live with her aunt and uncle. Theirs was an abolitionist household. They worked to end slavery. And they also ran a school where black children, including Frances, received an education. While still a young teen, she went to work as a housekeeper and seamstress in the household of a Baltimore bookstore owner. Her employers encouraged the inquisitive Frances to use their big library. She devoured books and began to write poetry and essays which appeared in the newspaper. By the time she was 20 years old, her writings were published in her first book, Forest Leaves. In 1850, Congress passed a law that allowed slave catchers to kidnap, enslave, and sell free Black people in states where slavery was legal. Her aunt and uncle fled from Maryland to Canada. Frances fled to Ohio, which did not allow slavery, and then two years later to Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, she became involved in the Underground Railroad, a movement that helped people escaping from slavery. Throughout this all, Frances continued to write and to publish books of poetry, much of it against slavery. 
In time, Frances became the first black woman to earn a living through the use of her words. Living modestly and donating much of her income to helping her uncles work with the Underground Railroad. In 1854, the Maine Anti Slavery Society hired her to travel all over the Northeast to make anti slavery speeches. She became one of the most famous speakers and authors of her time. All kinds of people came to hear her speak, but she made a point of not charging black people admission. Frances was progressive throughout her life. While she wrote and spoke against slavery, she also took other kinds of actions. She refused to wear or eat goods that were farmed by enslaved workers, including cotton and sugar. She wouldn't wear clothes made of cotton or eat food that contained sugar. In 1860, the year that the Civil War began, Frances Watkins married Benton Harper, who already had three children. The two had a daughter together, and Frances took time off from her writing and speaking to tend to her blended family. Unfortunately, just a few short years later, her husband died, leaving her as a young widow responsible for many unpaid bills. Frances Watkins Harper made the difficult decision to send her children to live with relatives and go back on speaking tours in order to make money and provide for her family. By then, slavery had ended, and she spoke for women's rights and for legal and civil rights for black people. She wrote poems and essays about the experiences of new freed slaves struggling to make their way despite the damage done to black people by slavery. In 1870, she joined the Unitarian Church of Philadelphia. There, she found a community where white and black people came together and where many shared her passion for justice. In many ways, Frances Harper was at home in two different worlds. Although she was used to working with white people, she also kept her connection to the black community in Philadelphia. She maintained her membership in the African Methodist Ep Episcopal Church, where she taught Sunday school. She wrote three novels specifically for black people, highlighting family connections and choices about racial identity. She pushed for education and voting rights for black people, and she encouraged black children to learn and grow, just as she had been encouraged as a child. During her long life, as you have heard, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper offered her voice, her words, her money, her labor, and most importantly, her love to the work of justice making for her people. She used her voice and her privilege as an educated black, free black woman to raise awareness of the plight of black people in the United States after the Civil War. We honor her memory and her place among our Unitarian Universalist ancestors. I got trained as a community organizer with Californians for Justice. And there we believed that people of color, immigrants, Poor folks, queer folks, disabled folks, and young people are the majority. And if we organized our communities to vote, we could shift power to reflect our values and interests and needs for racial justice and economic justice and more. And now as a field organizer with UU The Vote in Pennsylvania, I still believe this strategy that voting can be a means to a power shift. It's not the only strategy, but it is one worthwhile strategy among many. So welcome to my field. Here with my reading glasses and my large screen, instead of my sunglasses and walking shoes for door knocking, the organizing field of pandemic times where we gather in Zoom rooms, large and small, to reach thousands upon thousands of voters and potential voters. Just before recording this, 20 of us from Pennsylvania, Maryland, Washington, DC, my own Connecticut, and Massachusetts 
gathered in a Zoom room with our partners at CASA, a group organizing to build power in immigrant and working class communities in central Pennsylvania. In two hours, we sent over 60,000 texts to urge folks to check and update their voter registration or to get registered. We texted with people who had lost their jobs and apartments due to the pandemic, and we connected them with community resources. We texted with someone who is homeless and helped them get the information they need to be able to register to vote. We texted with lots of folks who weren't sure if their registration was up to date and helped them check their status. We know that over 90 of them followed up to register. And we texted with some people who said they follow God's law and their faith tells them not to participate in voting. Dear ones, our faith says that the here and now matters. That we live our faith not for the possibility of heaven when we die, but to create heaven here on earth. What we do, what you do, matters. And so we work. We you, you, the vote. We text the vote, we postcard the vote, we phone bank the vote. We use the tools at hand, spiritual, technological, relational, to connect with people around our values. If you haven't considered calling voters yet, please get step out of your comfort zone and try it. Join us in this sacred connection and faithful work. There is so much to do and so little time before the election. And there is so much to do after the election because we are in this not to elect a particular person, but to shift power to reflect our faith, our values, so that we can keep organizing for a world where every person is loved, sheltered, valued, and has what they need to thrive. A single honeybee makes just one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in its lifetime. It takes 70 honeybees just to make my morning tea. Like honeybees, it is up to each of us to do our part. Let us be honeybees. I ask you to do your one twelfth of a teaspoon. Perhaps two hours or ten hours of work, together it adds up to a whole lot of honey. I invite you to come join us in the virtual field. Make your small bit of honey so that together we as Unitarian Universalists can make gallons and gallons of impact. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. As a song leader, one of the songs that I keep returning to, particularly in these days of uprising and reckoning, is Ella's song, written by Dr. Bernice Johnson Regan, and performed by Sweet Honey and the Rock. Its lyrics, which I know some of you are already very familiar with, set to music the words of Ella Baker, an organizer, activist, leader, teacher, a prophet in the civil rights movement. Until the killing of black men, black mother's sons, becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of a white mother's son, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it happens. Ella Baker's words in this song are ones she wrote over 50 years ago, but they could have been written yesterday. And I'll be honest, 
that reality breaks my heart. It leaves me crying out. Will it ever end? For some of us, that question is one that has literal life and death implications that the rest of us cannot fully know. And as much as Ella Baker's words break my heart, they also charge my spirit. Their relevance to today's manifestation of resistance and community reminds me that we are a continuation of something much bigger, much more powerful, much more incredible than this single moment in our history. Our struggles to affirm the humanity and basic rights of black and brown lives in this country and world, they did not begin with us and they will not end with us. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Now, I admit it took me several years of singing these words to realize that Ella Baker probably wasn't telling me, run with the Aunt Mustafa Taha Mami, personally to never rest. No, in fact, none of us as individuals should be asked or expected to never rest. But all of us who believe in freedom as a collective, as a community, we cannot rest. Ella's song, Ella's words are a charge for all of us together as a movement to never rest. We cannot stop fighting. We cannot stop creating. We cannot rest until freedom in its truest and most universal form exists in our world. Our faith as Unitarian Universalists who don't all agree on what happens after this life can all believe that what happens in this life matters so deeply that we have been called heretics, broken unjust laws, and probably gotten ourselves on more than one government list to make it known that we will not rest until freedom for every last one of us comes. And to be that unceasing, everlasting, perseverant, irritatingly prophetic movement that never rests, we need to reaffirm, deepen, and re-reaffirm our connections to each other as Unitarian Universalists. To remember that if we do this work together, we can not rest. And just as important, to be a true continuation of that much bigger, much more powerful, much more incredible freedom movement, we not only need to sustain our relationships within our faith, but we must build and sustain the relationships with communities and frontline liberators who have been leading the way to universal freedom for generations. We who believe in freedom cannot rest and can not rest when we act as a truly interdependent collective. When we are carrying our load on the way to liberation, remembering that we are part of a movement reminds us that we are not carrying that load alone. Like a choir whose singers stagger their breathing to make sure a single note remains an unbroken sound, or a hospital that runs nonstop with a rotating staff, like migrating geese who take turns leading, following, or resting in their flying formation, we cannot rest and we can not rest until freedom comes if we sustain our connections to one another. We need each other so that when we as individuals do rest, we know our movement towards universal freedom carries on, waiting for us to return and temporarily relieve another of their liberation load. As we count down the days to election day, we know that no matter the outcomes, our work will continue. We will not rest. We can not rest if we take care of each other 
and our shared vision for universal freedom that is possible. Knowing that each and every one of us is doing the same for all of us. And knowing that our collaboration in this moment is a continuation of a movement that knows there will come a day when we, all of us who believe in freedom, can finally rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. This fall marks 150 years of universalism in Lincoln, Nebraska. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're sharing stories of universalism in those first couple of years. And we're hearing from congregants who have been spending the, the summer and last spring in our archives, digging through and finding stories about who we were and how and what that means for who we are now. We're putting excerpts of those presentations into the service, but the full presentations are available on our YouTube channel in a special playlist uh, called the 150th Anniversary. Today's presentation is from Marianne Meisner about some of the folks who were part of that founding generation of this congregation. The following fall, Reverend James Gorton came to Lincoln and the cornerstone for the chapel was laid October 1871. The chapel was dedicated Sunday, June 23, 1872. Unfortunately, by 1873, the financial panic of that year had caused the Universalist Convention to discontinue its support for the ministry of Mr. Gorton. He resigned after two years and left the area. May I be light in you. May you be light in me. Into our hearts into our souls let love abide may i be love in you may you be love in me from this place out to the world for all time. Spirit of life, sources of all that ever was and can be, we are guided by all that is sacred within our own hearts and minds to pray this prayer and to live this prayer. We offer up this simple and profound hope that we may be light, give light, and receive light in all the places we call home and in this sacred space that reaches across miles and experiences. That we may be love, give love, and receive love out in the world. May we never forget the impact and power of our voices. May we never lose sight of the songs in our hearts. D. Blanchard reminds us that they can be heard as songs of love or of longing, songs of encouragement or of comfort, songs of struggle or of security care. But most of all, they are the songs of life, giving testimony to what has been, 
giving praise for all we are given, giving hope for all we strive for, and giving voice to the great mystery that carries each of us in and out of this world. Today, we hear those songs in all the ways we are learning and growing as communities of faith, hope, and love. We hear them as, as little ones become young ones. We hear them as loved ones pass from this life and into the unknown. And we hear them in the streets and at our polling places as people of faith and conscience pave the way for a better world, a better understanding, deeper care and accountability. And we hear them in the silences, a deep awareness that there are those among us as yet unheard and unaccounted for. May we never, ever forget the impact and the power of our voices. May we never, ever lose sight of the songs in our hearts. May grace and mercy follow us wherever we may go whatever we, meet, we feel called to and toward in the days and weeks ahead. Amen. Ashe. And blessed be. Each week we set aside time in our service to share joys and sorrows with each other. When we do this in person, it's spoken into this shared space. When we do it online, it's typed into the chat box on YouTube. So as the next song plays, type out the name of somebody that you are holding, either in joy or in sorrow, and we'll hold that as a community. And I'll begin with a sorrow this week. I'm holding the family of Alandria Williams close to my heart. Alandria was the co-moderator of the Unitarian Universalist Association for the last three years. Their term ended in June. So if you've been to General Assembly in the last couple years, Alandria was one of the people moderating that gathering. They were a leader of vision and of great energy and grace with an understanding of what Unitarian Universalism meant for them and what we could be as a people. It is a hard loss in a fall of hard losses. And we know that even in a fall of hard losses, there is also great joy whether you're celebrating a birthday, an anniversary, a new job, a new car, a new way of looking at the world, or maybe just a really nice day outside where you're going to go out and play with your family. This is also a time to share joys. Please join us in this next song. See? 
I was 13 years old when I became a Unitarian Universalist. I was raised in this faith, but I was 13 when I claimed it as my own. It was a Sunday afternoon, and I was waiting for my parents to finish their committee meetings after service. All the other kids had left and I was bored. I wandered into the visitor's corner and a little red wallet card caught my eye. It said in bold letters on the front, what do Unitarian Universalists believe? My 13 year old self wondered, what do Unitarian Universalists believe? As I read the 10 statements written by the Reverend David O'Rankin in my heart in my soul, as I read those words, I said, yes, this is what I believe. One phrase in particular planted itself in me like the deepest truth and I never forgot it. We believe in the motive force of love. It was in that moment when I knew that this was my religion. I start with this story to ground the work of UU The Vote in our theology, which is its foundation and its inspiration. This year marks the 250th anniversary of what we celebrate as the beginning of universalism in the United States. It was on September 30th, 1770, that universalist John Murray preached his first sermon on this continent. And the truth that I read in that little red wallet card, the truth I've never forgotten, is the message of universalism. 250 years ago, in the context of religious notions of God rooted in punishment, damnation, and the division of humanity between worthy and unworthy, saved and damned, the idea of universal salvation, that God's love is unconditional, that no one is cast out, and that salvation is not individual but collective, was radical and liberating. Universalism proclaimed that humanity was bound together in a common destiny and that love, love is the thread that binds each of us to the other and everyone to creation. Universalists believe that God is love. They also believed in hell. They just believed that it existed here and now on the earth. The great universalist preacher Hosea Ballou was clear about how politicians and those in power used fear, stoked fear, to protect their greed and corruption and self-interest, and he knew the suffering that resulted from that. Rather than speak of theology in terms of speculative notions of God, Ballou spoke of it in terms of human experience here and now and our relationships to each other. A society that lives out the motive force of love would be one that fosters joy and liberation and thriving for all people. This is the highest calling of our faith as Unitarian Universalists, to live out, defend, and embrace this motive force of love in our lives, in our actions, in our commitments, and in our society. This is why you, you, the vote says vote love. Today, in our context, we are witnessing the emboldening and authorization of ideologies rooted not in love and interdependence, but in domination, authoritarianism, and dehumanization. And just to be clear, this is not new. It has a long and deadly history on this continent going back more than 400 years. And yes, even our universalist ancestors came from that same lineage of Christian European conquest and limited the vision of universalism only to white society, a limit that we are tr still trying to redeem ourselves from. It is dehumanization that creates systems that put children in cages, that deny health care to our transgender siblings, that allow police violence and the murder of black people to continue unabated and without accountability. 
dehumanization that allows triage protocols that devalue the lives of disabled people and that lead to systemic divestment from communities. The resources from housing to education, healthcare to jobs, and the criminalization of poverty. Just as Hosea Ballou named it, the tool of dehumanization, its propaganda is fear. Propaganda that tells us to fear our neighbor, that we are not family and kin, but enemies. This is the exact opposite of our theology of universalism that tells us that we have a common destiny and we are connected to one another in love. This is why you, you, the vote says vote, love, defeat, hate. And while the forces of dehumanization and domination have always been a part of U.S. history, so too have been those who have resisted and organized for the values of dignity, equity, humanity, and love. These days are heartbreaking, they're infuriating, and they're frightening. On days when I lose my own strength, I turn to the words of Alice Walker, who reminds us, we remember our ancestors because it is an easy thing to forget that we are not the first to suffer, rebel, fight, love, and die. The grace with which we embrace life in spite of the pain and the sorrow is always a measure of what has gone before us. We remember our ancestors, theological, familial, and in movement. We remember Francis, Ellen Watkins, Harper, Hosea Ballou, John Brown, Sitting Bull, Ida B. Wells, Dr. King, Anne Braden, and so many more whose names history does not remember. Those who struggled and risked and fought and loved for the principles of justice, equity, liberty. This is why in You, You, The Vote, we say vote love, we say defeat hate, because dear ones, we are on a precipice. Every single one of our most deeply held values is on the line right now. The current powers in government are showing in everything they do that the inherent worth and dignity of so many immigrants, black people, disabled folks, trans and queer people does not matter to them. Human agency, interdependence, the democratic process are being disrupted and defiled daily. It is a radical act of faith to not only continue to believe in all of our cherished principles, but to demand them by speaking out, taking risks, organizing, leveraging our resources and building networks of solidarity and power to protect one another and these values. We are on a precipice and our actions right now will affect whether we have a chance to continue to bring our bold values forward, to rebuild, expand, and strengthen our democracy, to confront police violence, to upend racial inequity, to change divestment from communities and make moves to protect the climate. Now is the time to draw on the grace, the courage, and the strength of all those who went before, to widen our comfort zones, and to do all we can to vote love and defeat hate. If you haven't taken any form of action yet, sign up for a shift with You, You, The Vote. I can tell you that it's fun. And if you've written postcards to voters, but you feel nervous about phone banking, do it with your fellow You, You's. And if you've been all in with you, you, the vote from the beginning, keep it up and start planning for how you will show up and organize after November 3rd. Because democracy will not be restored in one election. It's been under systemic attack for decades. And justice will not roll down like waters in one election. Voting matters. It's absolutely critical. But it is not the end. It is just one piece of the long haul work of organizing for a future where all are free and where all can thrive. Will you show up in the streets, set up to contribute to a bail or legal assistance fund, open your church building to protesters needing refuge from state repression, tap into your own endowment or discretionary funds to make sure that grassroots organizers have the funds they need for their work 
There is so much to do. And our faith calls us to love more radically, to give more generously, to believe more fervently that another world is possible and be willing to be all in for that future. As you've heard me say many times before, this is no time for a casual faith, no time for a casual commitment to what you hold most dear. And this is no time to go it alone. Friends, we are in this work together. I invite you to be deeper in this work of you, you, the vote with us. May we remember that we are held by love always. May we remember that we are held by and with one another. And may we all together be all in today, tomorrow, next month, and next year for justice, for love, for democracy, and for a future that is free and thriving for all people. May it be so. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle around to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now. In all of the major religious traditions, people have marked time in seasons. The Jewish High Holy Days, the Muslim period of Ramadan, earth-based celebrations of solstice and equinox. 
Each of these seasons, in its own right and in its own way, helps humans to mark the passage of time, to reconnect with what is good and holy and true in each of us and in one another, to travel the spectrum of human emotion and experience as our ancestors and their ancestors have done for generations. And then there's the rest of the year, the daily turn of the earth, the routines of everyday living. In the Christian tradition, these periods between the major liturgical seasons are known as ordinary time, the weeks when people carry on with the regular duties and rituals of work and family. The wise ones knew that there is a deep importance to this rhythm, that we need both the routine and the normalcy of ordinary time and the temporary suspension of routine and normalcy that the liturgical seasons bring. But what happens when that cycle is upended, when ordinary time is disrupted, maybe permanently, when every day is a constant barrage of hurricanes and wildflowers, of police killings and uprisings, of viruses and climate catastrophe, of repression and resistance. These are no ordinary times, beloveds. But our yearning persists. Perhaps not for ordinary time with all the ways the status quo is brutal to so many among us, but for extraordinary time. A time when hope is plentiful, when justice is pervasive, when community is resilient, and when love governs us all. Our Unitarian Universalist faith compels us to be builders of extraordinary time, even in the midst of profoundly abnormal ones. Our faith compels us to claim our agency and take action, even as our broken systems strain to keep us passive. To affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every single one of our human siblings by refusing to accept brutality and repression. To lean in to our radical interdependence by working together, organizing our communities to be powerful and prophetic in the face of all the forces that would dehumanize and kill us. Right now, you, you, the vote is working ceaselessly to build this kind of extraordinary time. Across the country, hundreds of our congregations are mobilizing volunteers in deep partnership with local and national partners. UUs have reached out to hundreds of thousands of voters with texts and postcards and calls on track for a million before November. We have had deep conversations about the issues that are central to our deepest values. We are fighting voter suppression, mobilizing those who have been disenfranchised, registering neighbors who've never had the chance to make their voices heard. And we are also building power and resources and connections to face together whatever comes after November 3rd. So today, we are asking you to join with us in building this extraordinary time that we are all yearning for. And to mark this threshold year of 2020, and all the possibility and peril it represents. We are inviting every single Unitarian Universalist to help us move into the future, toward extraordinary time in November and beyond, by making a gift to you, you the vote. And since numbers are significant, we want to encourage you to consider a gift that honors the number 2020. Perhaps you are someone who could make a gift of $2,020, an amount that would fund 50,000 calls to voters in critical states. If this is you, now is the time for your generosity. Or maybe you're someone who could give $202 or $20.20 or some multiple of those numbers. Helping us pay for fellowships and organizers and staff across the country who are coordinating our phone banks working with state advocacy networks, building infrastructure of volunteers that's going to last us far beyond this election. Or maybe you, like so many among us, are suffering financially during this time, but maybe your gift of $2.02 can be a symbolic gesture that we are all one, that we are working together to build this extraordinary time. Together, friends, as Unitarian Universalists, we are doing extraordinary things in these abnormal and heartbreaking times. 
and there is so much more to do. Please give as generously as you are able. For all we have received and for all that we have found the courage to give, may we be truly thankful. Amen. Hi, I'm Nicole Presley, National Organizer of You the Vote, and I'm so honored to be a part of You the Vote and a part of this special worship service. By this time, you've probably gotten used to virtual worship. You've made sure your computer is charged, you've searched your email for Zoom links, or you've scrolled through your social media feed for the live stream. But from whatever platform you're entering worship today, you are in sacred space. Getting here was not easy. Remember the spring? Remember many of us had to learn new skills and to stretch ourselves and maybe our internet speed to continue to gather with our beloved faith community. We learned Zoom, we downloaded apps, and we reached out for help to be with one another. Transformation is always a stretch and we need to bring that same energy to this year's election. In the past few months, I have witnessed amazing things from all of you. We created a goal to reach out to 1 million voters 
and we are almost there. We stretched ourselves. We stretched ourselves to get on another Zoom call to learn to text voters, phone bank, and send postcards. We learned how to be vulnerable and have critical conversations with members of our communities. You use, we are not just a faith community that believes another world is possible, but we are a community that is willing to act to make that world a reality. We have a legacy of showing up and we know that our victories are never guaranteed. And we know that those victories are never won by those in power ceding it willingly. The people imagined it, the people demanded it, and we the people gathered to make it so. In all of our movements, the stakes were high, but instead of mobilizing out of the fear of defeat, we have organized out of a sacred calling to build a world that we know is possible. That is why nonpartisan work is not just important, but is absolutely revolutionary. We come together to learn, to create, and to put into practice ways of being towards our collective liberation. That is our victory. And as the chant goes, I believe that we will win. I believe that together through sacred and sustained work now and beyond November, we can call forth a world that moves towards our collective liberation. But we must all show up to vote love in 2020. That means showing up to the work that is needed, not just the work that is comfortable. That means showing up in service and in solidarity to combat a simple campaign of voter suppression and intimidation. That means recognizing that white supremacy and capitalism are the technologies through which political agency and democracy are stripped from marginalized communities. So when I say vote love, I don't just mean voting our values, although I absolutely want you to do that if you are able. I don't just mean showing up to voter contact work, even though I absolutely want everyone to join into this work. I mean centering the oppressed, working to free them all, to defend black lives, to fight for climate justice and healthcare for all, for reproductive justice and for safe and thriving schools and communities. I mean continuing whatever work is necessary to make sure every ballot is counted and that the results and will of the people are respected. We have important choices to make in 2020, but if we are to really vote love and defeat hate in 2020, we must also commit to continue to side with love every single day after November 3rd and into 2021. If you are in it for the long haul, if you believe that another world is possible because you are gathered in a community that puts faith into action, if you are ready to stretch beyond November 3rd to protect democracy, join us. Take the Vote Love Pledge to join a team that is organizing to take action in this election and ready to mobilize after November 3rd for the work ahead. Join me, take your phone out, Text Pledge Love to 51555 to take the pledge today or go online at uuthevote.org. We need everyone in this work. Thank you for finding your role in this work. Thank you for doing it with joy and hopefulness. And thank you for joining UU The Vote. Let's make sure love always wins. As we extinguish the chalice flame, which has danced through our time together, we commit ourselves again to keep the flame of justice burning bright, especially in those times and places where justice is denied with those people whose humanity is denied. And never will we extinguish the flame that burns in our communities the flame of love, the flame that burns in our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and our bodies, the flame that burns in our care for one another in our communities. Friends, I offer you these words from the Reverend Darcy Roke. There is too much hardship in this world to not find joy every day. 
There is too much injustice in this world to not right the balance every day. There is too much pain in this world to not heal every day. Each of us ministers to a weary world. Let us go forth now and do that which calls us to make this world more loving, more compassionate, and more filled with the grace of divine presence every day. Every day. Every day. Please join me in hymn number 1017, Building a New Way. Peace and freedom. 